And uh, Board Member Dudek will lead us in the salute. Thank you. All right. So item five, our agenda review. Are there any items that we're unaware of at this time? Nope. Item six, special presentations, correspondence, superintendent and staff comment. We'll start with our superintendent report. Hello, board. Sorry, just getting up here for a second. Uh, this is the time where I want to, um, it's coming up, uh, highlight uh, with some of the things that have been going on since we last came together uh, as a, at a board meeting. So. Um, on February 24th, um, Adams Middle School had a no name calling week um, and a no one sits alone day that was put on by the Associated Student Body and the SAVE Club. Uh, and uh, really a great event to promote inclusivity uh, amongst their school. It's been exciting to have sports back. Um, and so there's a basketball game and our cheerleaders out there for Edna Hill. This is versus an Oakley school, Delta Vista. So congratulations to those teams. And thanks to all the coaches who are putting on uh, this season. I had the uh, great privilege of going on uh, a couple Fridays ago to the Special Olympic Unified Basketball event that was put on by Adams Middle School. And so it involved all of our middle schools and all of uh, Liberty's high schools as well. And it was just a, a fantastic uh, event. Um, if you're not familiar with Unified Basketball, it's where um, uh, typically developing students um, are paired together with some of our special education students um, and they play together. It's just a, it's a wonderful event. This was at the opening ceremonies, the band played. Uh, that's one of our uh, eighth graders, Vivian there, who uh, recited the Pledge of Allegiance for everybody as the color guard was coming out. It was really a special event and then Here's just some other pictures from the actual basketball activity itself. And so I want to thank Katie Human, who's a teacher at Adams, who helped organize it, and Kevin Brannon, who's the custodian, who did a lot of work to get ready for it. Just everybody that worked together to put that on. So it was definitely the highlight of the week. It's also Odyssey of the Mind time. So um, this took place out at Adams as well. And so this was a Saturday activity. It was the regional competition. So. Um, there's three divisions plus a primary division where uh, students compete together in teams of usually anywhere from four to seven kids. Um, and there's different problems that they go for. And so we had multiple teams that actually advanced on to the state. We still call it state. It's, it's really, um, there's a Northern California and a Southern California um, division now because there's so many kids that participate in California. And so all of these schools, will, all of these um, teams will be going to the state tournament uh, coming up and then to compete to try to get the chance to go on to the world tournament. And so I wanted to take a second to highlight all the coaches. So those of them that are on the left, we have several of our teachers and parents that give up a lot of time to do this. This is a, it's a several month process. It's usually meeting a couple times a week. Oftentimes it's in garages or basements or um, sometimes in a classroom somewhere. So really thank you to all of them who put that on. Um, family Literacy Night at Ron Nunn School, so it was a Camp Read A Lot theme, um, so I appreciate all the people that came out for that. It's fun to see us getting back to some of our typical activities going on, so great job to Ron Nunn. I thought these were great. This is our, uh, uh, we have an art show coming up, which I'll show you in just a second, but this were some of our entries from the Harvest Grove uh, uh, Digital Academy, Online Academy. So. Uh, really talented students there. And this is the art show for that's going to take place. Um, there's going to be a special reception on Tuesday, April 12th um, with an award ceremony. And then we have a relationship with uh, the city where uh, the pieces of art hang on both levels of the community center for about a month over there. And so if you ever get a chance to look, it's there's tremendous art that's there. It's all around the building and it's wonderful to look at. Uh, I also want to take a second to uh, recognize, we recognized Edna Hill last time, but they actually got to go to Monterey and receive their, um, uh, their award as their sixth time being recognized as a California Schools to Watch. And I have uh, Edna Hill Principal Kirsten Job wanted to say something to you. So congratulations, Kirsten. 
Thank you, Dr. Eden. So I wanted to um, bring back from Monterey the award that is for you, for our school board, and for Dr. Eden to, as a schools to watch, this is not for our school, but it's for our entire district. So to thank you for all of your support and vision that allows us to, for our sixth time to be recognized, it is not alone. It's because we are all working together. So thank you very much. And this is for you. So thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much and congratulations, Kirsten. And then they also, as, as part of the conference, they actually presented on their advisory program to the other middle schools that were there. So really a nice honor to be recognized in doing that. Uh, also, we saw the art show. We have lots of volunteer art docents that are out there doing programs. So this is uh, Mrs. Ramos, who's uh, working with some second graders uh, to imitate Kandinsky. And so thank you for doing that. And then I wanted to recognize that uh, yesterday or the day before it was announced that we have a graduate of distinction from the Liberty uh, High School District, and that's Mr. Chris Calabresi. So I wanted to congratulate him. We were all happy to learn that he had graduated. And we also were, uh, there were three, um, three honorees across the entire district. And so um, it's, a, it's a great honor. Congratulations, Chris. And uh, I know we'll hear more about the celebrations to come. Uh, also, last, uh, last time we shared with you the employees of the year from throughout the district from the different sites. And I'm excited today to, to share the, the individual employees of the year. Um, for the entire district. And so this is Shelly Grimm. She's a wonderful instructional aide over at Pioneer. So she was uh, named the district um, instructional aid support uh, provider of the year. So congratulations to Shelly. This is Luisa San Andreas. She's our wonderful food service lead at Cray Elementary. Certainly um, this year has brought a ton of challenges to food services where we're serving more than twice as many kids than we were last year. And uh, Luis is a ray of sunshine and uh, very deserving of this award. So congratulations to her. She's the food services employee of the year. Lizandra Gutierrez is our secretary in maintenance operations. So she's our secretary of the year. Lizandra does a great job managing so much that goes on in maintenance and grounds and landscaping and custodial. So there's, there's, I think Bob's here, but there's no way that that department would run without her. No offense, Bob. So she's amazing. And then uh, Terry Cruz, who was actually the day custodian that opened up Ron Nunn School, and that school has been open for a while, was celebrated as um, the custodian of the year for the district. So congratulations to Terry, just a wonderful uh, fixture at that school for so many years. And then our teacher of the year for the district was Kathleen Brown, who's a math teacher at Edna Hill Middle School. And so I just wanted to congratulate all of our, our district employees of the year. There is a, a county competition that happens now where they go on. And so their names are being put forward for consideration at that level. And that is my report to you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Eaton. All right, uh, any board member comment at this time? Nope, all right. Moving on to item seven, public comment, oral communications. Uh, would anybody like to make a motion to open public comment? I'll take a, I'll make a motion we open public comment. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, uh, has anybody turned in speaker cards tonight? I'll make a motion. No? Okay. I'll make a motion we close public comment. I'll second again. All right. It's been moved and seconded that we close public comment. All in favor? Aye. 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 No public comment this evening. All right. Moving on to our consent items. Uh, these are our regularly scheduled consent items. Would anybody like to pull or discuss any items 8.0 through 8.4? Now I'll make a motion to approve consent items 8.0 to 8.4. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent items. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. All right, moving on to item nine, hearings and appeals. We have none. Item 10, presentations, reports, and other action items. We do have one item to report out of closed section. Uh, a majority of the board in closed session voted 5-0 to reject Keenan claim number 600534, 
slash KNAK and company claim number 22009. All right, moving on to item 10.1. Excited tonight to have a student presentation about new oil and gas drilling near Brentwood schools. Okay, hello? Okay, everyone can hear me, right? Awesome, um, well, just to give myself a small introduction, my name is Alexi Lindemann and I'm currently a senior at Heritage High School. I'm also the chair of Sustainable Leaders in Action, which is the youth branch of the nonprofit Sustainable Contra Costa. Um, and tonight I'll just be informing you about new drilling that's going on or that's proposed um, in Brentwood along with the current drilling that's going on near Antioch. So up here is a map um, of Antioch and Brentwood. I know I'm a visual person, so I like to see things where they are. Um, and I'll be explaining this map more in detail later on, but just to get an idea, um, in, the, in the yellow, there's two current active drilling rigs, and this is along Deer Valley Road. If you are familiar where that windy road is that goes to Antioch um, near Kaiser, that's where it is. Um, and the current drilling sites are only a half mile away from Kaiser Permanente. And then the red um, circle is the proposed oil drilling site, and this is only 900 feet from Brentwood Homes. Um, it also has some close school schools that are close in proximity, including Loma Vista Elementary School and then Heritage High School where I attend. So the history of oil in Brentwood. Um, Brentwood Hills and Shadow Lakes, which are right near Adams and Heritage High School, um, are built over an old oil and gas field. And production was at its peak in the 1960s through the 1970s. Later, these wells were capped and methane vents were installed to prevent dangerously high concentration of flammable, flammable methane. Some methane vents are disguised as street lamps and others are directly built into the houses. There's about 75 of them, as indicated by the purple dots above that are built um, directly into the homes in Brentwood Hills. And on the far right-hand side, you can see these um, little street lamps and they don't have light bulbs on the top, so they're really methane vents. Um, and they're just kind of incorporated into the um, neighborhood there. So new drilling in Brentwood. Um, in May of 2020, Power Drive submitted to the county a permit application for oil and gas drilling. This proposed site is about 900 feet from Brentwood Homes, three quarters of a mile from Loma Vista Elementary School, and one mile from Adams Middle School. Oil drilling is known to lower air quality, release greenhouse gases, methane and CO2, and contaminate water. There's a huge public outcry which demanded a full environmental review after this permit application was submitted. Um, and we're waiting for that environmental review to be released. So the impacts of oil and gas drilling in close proximity, um, economic, the drilling site will lower retail values and making houses worth less. Um, also houses in the area sink due to the oil being removed beneath them and releveling of these houses costs between 25 to $100,000. On the right hand side, there's a sinkage example. It's not the most extreme one, um, but it's basically where the concrete is like splitting and in other houses I've heard like the, there's like, it was literally tilted and that's where they had to completely relevel it. I know a couple friends who have um, this problem. And um, drilling in this area will not really lower overall oil prices as they are set by the international market. Um, I know oil, I mean, gas prices are super high now, but the oil extracted here is only like a drop in a very large bucket um, and the health and environmental impacts far outweigh these costs. So the health impacts, um, the drilling site will emit toxic air pollutants and a 2021 Stanford study showed serious health impacts, including asthma, heart disease, and preterm births from living within 2.5 miles of drill sites. If you look at this previous, at this map, which I now labeled, um, I put little 2.5 mile radiuses around both the current and proposed drilling site. And in total, it covers about 15 public schools and 18,000 homes that are in this range um, and will be negatively impacted by the pollutants. So East Contra Costa is already downwind from toxic emission, emissions 
from four Contra Costa oil refineries, and our asthma rates are in the 80th percentile reflect this. 80th percentile meaning like our asthma rates are 80% higher than those in, than other places in California. And of course, the environmental impacts, methane a greenhouse gas release is 80 times more harm is 80 times more harmful than CO2 is released and this speeds up climate change. We see this a lot with um, the very extreme forest fires that have been going on lately. And then of course, millions of gallons of toxic wastewater is stored in a giant wastewater well in the middle of agriculturally zoned land. On this map in the little blue boxes, there's two. One is the current wastewater that's between the yellow and the red dot. Um, and that is in the middle of like this farmland. And then the other blue box, um, that wastewater well was permitted in December of 2021, so quite recently, and they are repurposing an old one. So these wastewater wells, they just take the water that's produced from the oil and gas drilling sites and they store them in there. Um, this water contains natural radioactive materials and um, heavy metals, which are known to um, increase rates of disease. Okay, so we need your help. Um, upcoming on this Saturday, there's going to be a no drilling Contra Costa youth march and rally. And this is going to be um, on March 12th, this Saturday again, from 1, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. at the Antioch Community Center. It's about half an hour away from here. Um, and it's right across the way from Deer Valley Road, so, sorry, Deer Valley High School. So if you know where that is, it's right next to there. Um, and then signing the new or the no new oil and gas drilling Contra Costa petition. There's a link up there. It's also on the QR code link tree, um, along with a bunch of other resources are on that link tree. And then um, I know it might be a little bit late, but passing a resolution to ban new oil and gas drilling and phase out existing drilling sites in Contra Costa County and send this to the County Board of Supervisors and Planners. I sent um, Nicole a uh, example resolution um, of that if you want to take a look at it. I know I did a presentation like this to LUHSD and they're working on writing one too. So you might be able to collaborate with them about this. Um, so that's pretty much all I had today. If you want more information, of course, it's on that QR code or short link. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It gives us all a lot to think about. All right, moving on, item 10.2, approval of the second interim budget. Good evening, board. Um, tonight in front of you to discuss and present the second interim budget. Um, as you remember, in January, the governor um, released his um, fiscal outlook for the following year. And really not some good things in there because the state finance continues to improve. Um, I know we're all watching the stock market, what's going on in the world and, and looking at how much that will affect us later on. Um, it, it, we'll have to wait and see what that looks like at the May revise. But right now, all the all the prognosis looks pretty good um, relative to substantiate his January revise, and we'll have to wait for the May revise to see what gets changed from that. But it, but right now, um, the state economic health is healthy. Um, the big change at the January re, January budget release is the gray line down in the middle, where the governor increased the 22-23 and 23-24 colas. Um, you remember at the May revise, which would have been um, the, the line above, um, he, he released uh, his, his COLAs at that time. It was 5.07 and for this current year, 2.48 the following year, and 3.11 in 23-24. In January, he, cha he changed his outlook and in 22-23 increased it by 2.85 to 5.33. And in 23-24, he increased what he'd already had projected. And remember that we used the May revised numbers in the, in the budget that we adopted in June. So the change in January is really 2.85 increase for next year and a 0.5% increase in the following year. And we'll see what happens to those numbers at the May revised. Um, 
when we talk about coal and the things that, that go along, COLA, of course, brings more revenue um, in, in lots of different ways. Um, but we also, whenever we turn the page every year, we have increased costs really to step and column. Um, our, our employee retirement contributions, special education, and we have to watch liability insurance and any settlements we reach with our employee groups. When you look at our history, our COLA history, as well as our turning the page history, you can see starting in, in 1920, um, you can see we had a COLA, but the, the expenditures outreached the COLA that year, um, including a pay raise. And in 2021, um, which was really the big year of our of the COVID impact, is we got no COLA that year, but in costs increased that year as well. And then you can see the following three years, the projected COLA that the governor's um, proposed in January. When you combine all those together in that last column, you can see that our expenditures um, to date, including the two pay raises, have, out, have outstripped or exceeded what we get in COLA relative to percentage. Um, some of those things, just a reminder, I know you've seen some of these in your packet, we've talked about them. PERS continues to go up over time. Um, and you know that the stock market's done better. And so the actuarial report that just came out for PERS was more positive. So the column on the right shows that projected, those rates may go down. Um, and we're using some of those in our projections, but the board doesn't meet for a couple of, for another month and we'll get those that updated by the time we get in June. STRS is also increasing and you can see really in this year we increased just under a percent because the governor and the legislature over the last two years have bought down STRS for behalf, on behalf of districts in the state. But you can see right now there is no relief for 22-23, so we're looking at a, over a 2% increase um, to our, our, our STRS contribution on behalf of our employees. And what that looks like is, is really if you look at the PERS increase for next year and the STRS increase for next year, that's increases to our expenditures of $1.5 million before we get to do anything else. So just a reminder and something we need to watch out. We know there's noise at the legislature level that we might get some STRS relief. We have need to wait and see what that looks like with all the other things going on in the world around us. Another thing that affects our budget is looking at enrollment. And you know if you've driven around Brentwood, you can see that homes are going in. And, and if you talk to any realtors, there's a resale market going on as well that's pretty hot. And, and this really, this graph really shows that this, even this year, um, with everything else going on, we continue to see enrollment growth. It's not at the rate we've seen before, but it's still enrollment growth, that's, which is positive. We're not a declining enrollment district, and we still have not reached where we were in 1920. Um, we're about 135 up from really that fourth day of school when we drop all the no-shows. Um, actually from the first day of school and that's really what our budget was built on when you take when you drop those kids and you start from there we're actually about 193 up from that no show day so you know you have to look at those numbers and we continue to watch those and that will be a big factor relative to build developing and finalizing the budget that we'll bring back to you in june um, the other thing really quickly is if you look at that orange line at the bottom the orange line is the kindergarten enrollment number and the dark brown line all the way at the top is the eighth grade enrollment number. So when we, when our eighth graders leave us after the celebration activity in June, there's a 240 student difference between current enrollment projections for kindergarten and eighth grade. So for us to continue to be a, a, a district that gains enrollment, we have to make up that 240 plus to get any other growth out of in the long term. So it's something we watch closely and it's, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's a historical trend that's that's played out that way for us, but that could change overnight. It could change over any summer and we have to watch that closely, especially relative to um, the, the market housing rates, the higher the cost of housing, the trend of seeing older kids come into those homes rather than younger kids. So we'll have to continue to watch that. So there's been a lot of conversation around projecting ADA. Um, we know that there's been some hold harmless rules. So this chart with all these numbers on it's a way to sort of walk through what's going on with it. In 1920, our ADA held in March was about um, 8,900 kids, 8980. In 2021, we had dramatic loss in enrollment, about 300, 350 kids we lost. But the governor and the legislature held us harmless to 1920. So we got to use the ADA from 1920 and plug it into 2021. We didn't even collect ADA that year, technically for reporting purposes. We have we have the absences, but we never ran the ADA report. We weren't required to because of the loss of enrollment and just what, a, what attendance looked like that year. This year, we didn't have a held harmless relative to the legislature. 
we use the hold harmless that's built into the LCFF calculator. The calculator says, what's the higher of the ADA of the current year or the prior year? So it's, it's, it's kind of like a held harmless that's built into the LCFF calculator. And you can see that the 2122 ADA, which is actually headlined by the brown heading, actual ADA or P1, is significantly lower than what we budgeted because we got to use 2021. So we're still using 8980, which is from 1920, but our actual ADA this year right now, as of the end of January, was about 8562. And you can see that's 418 kids down. So if we actually had to use that ADA this year, that would be um, fiscally really significant uh, a burden to us. And we don't um, because of the LCFF calculator. Now, next year, when we roll into next year, the first column in 22-23 is really what we were talking about at first interim. Let's take our enrollment projection for next year and look at 95% of that number. And that gets us to about 8762. And those numbers are updated based on current enrollment from what they were at first interim. Now, in the old model, using the LCFF calculator, you would take that column and compare it to this year's ADA. So this year's ADA, if nothing changed from now, we're comparing 8562 to 8762. Well, we get to use 8762 if that rule was true. But in January, the governor, knowing that this is an issue for most districts, especially districts that are declining, said, is making a proposal that, in his proposal, is we get to use the average of the last three years. So we get to take the current ADA that we're using or the, the ADA that is actual in this year plus 2021 and 1920. And you average those together over three years and our ADA right now projected for next year using the governor's proposal is 8841. That's the ADA that's being used in, in the first interim or the second interim report and the LCFF calculator that's in front of you tonight. But you can see that's still 139 students below the ADA reporting right now. So, and we'll talk about that a little later. Now that's a lot of information. Be glad to talk to you at later, but it's sort of the idea. What I would say is that there's two things that may happen between now and the end of the year. Number one, is our ADA may improve and that will help that average or one of the five bills that are running through the legislature on how to calculate EA will come forward and we'll have new rules in June to process at that time. And honestly, the legislature working at how do they help, how do they help districts land in a better manner rather than seeing the really dramatic effect of loss in ADA, especially for declining districts. So more to watch on that, but that's sort of a, a quick snapshot of that. Um, the, ADA really is built on and drives the LCFF calculator. And this is just a quick snapshot of, we get a we get a, a certain dollar amount per ADA. And you can see there's different dollar amounts, whether they're K3, 4, 6, and 7, 8. So that's the base ADA in the first column. The second column is what we get for supplemental students. But we only get our percentage of unduplicated. Our percentage of unduplicated at this time is 29%. So for kindergartners, they could get 1,700. We get 29% of that, so we get 532. Now, if we were a district of 90% free and reduced lunch unduplicated, we get most of that plus more. So you can see sort of that's that's an example of sort of how that works for us. But you can see K3, 4, 6, 7, 8, you can see what the total estimated per pupil allocations we're getting that built the budget for technically this year and, and into the out years. And you can see if you compare us to nine uh, into a high school district, they get about $10,656 per student if they were if they had our ADA or our unduplicated count. So just a story, and we get about, right now we're proposing about $9,000 a student this year per, per student. LCFF Renew, above the yellow line is what we were looking at at first interim, um, 21, 22, about $82 million. That really hasn't changed. The first interim projections for revenue is about $82.4 million. That's before the governor did his rele release, which he increased COLA, and it changed some of the rules about how we calculate ADA. So the bottom two, just as a reference, if we used our ADA method where we did our, AD, our enrollment times 95%, that'd be about $84.2 million. Using the governor's three-year average, it's about $84.9 million. And of course, right now, our, our budget right now built for next year in terms of the second interim is based on the bottom line. Revenue versus expenditures. We, these are the things we need to watch. Um, ADA is not gonna be harmless anymore. Um, we, we calculate the higher the two, and right now we're looking at those things and we've talked about that. The one thing I'll point out is even though our ADA is going down, the COLAs offset that loss. So it still looks like we're getting a revenue increase really because of the COLA increase, not because, and, and which is offset some of that loss in ADA. Um, you know, that's, that's a whole lot of 
Excel spreadsheets if you really want to see the math on that, and I know you don't, so I'm going to move on. So assumptions looking forward, at COLA for 2021, there's no change in this year, um, and, and the same for 21, 22, and ADA for 22, 23 will really be based on the three-year average looking at those things. Assumptions, we built the stirs and purrs, staffing, step and column, service costs, one-time funding, all those are built into our assumptions as we move forward. Um, we did reach a settlement agreement following the board adoption in June, and we've, we reached that agreement knowing the COLAs we had at that time and all the out-year information we had at that time and the current negotiation process and process, which we have an item later tonight to talk about. Another thing to look at is, is really looking at us in reference and reference and relative to other districts. The green bars, which is the highlight, which is the, the, um, the, the information on the left-hand side of the screen is, is really the green bars or the average per student LCFF revenue compared to about 10 districts across the county. And you can see we are the lowest, we receive the lowest per student revenue of, um, of any district in the county. And some of those districts are more than us because they, they get their parcel tax as well. So we're the lowest funded district. On the right-hand side is the percent of money that we spend on salary and benefits in the unrestricted budget as a percentage of expenditures. And you can see we pay the most per dollar for employee benefits and salaries than anybody else in the county. There's some that are close, but you can see quite a range. So it's, it's, it's just something for us to watch. And what I'll say is if we, if the higher that percentage of salary and benefits in the unrestricted budget, if something really happens, the amount of money we have flexibility to do things with really is, is dramatically decreased. New costs is, and this is something we covered at first interim as we opened up the alternative ed um, Harvest Grove. Um, we, we, added, we, were, we added staff and that got added to the budget after the budget adoption and that was, a, that was addressed at first interim. We continue to watch special ed costs. They, they continue to increase as they do every year and we're watching that closely along with the, the, some of the funding that the state's providing. And we, we, we still need to watch those costs associated with COVID and safety as, as rules change around us and the needs of our school schools and students and staff um, move on. So looking at the unrestricted budget tonight, um, looking at really the budget, really, um, you can see I still have two columns for first interim as if we used or didn't use um, um, one-time money. So if you just look at the last two columns, which is with the one-time money, you can see revenue is up just a tiny little bit. Expenditures have gone up a little bit. And, and I'm going to cover these in a little more detail further down. We increased our contribution because routine restricted maintenance, because expenditures went up. Our revenue to expenditures, we're still deficit spending this year. Um, beginning balance is just about what it was, um, the same as what it was back at first interim. And our ending balance went down because of our expenditures went up and our deficit spending went up by about 300. So looking at what changed, LCF up, up about 24K, working through the, um, the LCFF calculator that's really the one we're currently using is still dated November. We're waiting for a new one. And we have some local resources and donation money that was received. On the expenditure side, salary, certificated salaries down about 60,000, classified salaries up because of some aid, some, some aid, issue, aid work that was going on. There's benefits and salary driven costs down um, as we true those, those, those expenditures up. Books and supplies up by about 150 on the unrestricted side, contract and services up by about 290 mostly because of transportation and services costs relative to our transportation requirements. And we have to increase our contribution to the restricted budget because expenditures went up because it's a 3% of our expenditures. Um, looking at the multi-year on the unrestricted and really what people look at is, is, the, is the couple of things I look on here is you can see revenue is continuing to grow, but you can see next year it doesn't grow, but it starts to grow after that because we're projecting ADA growth in those out years. If you look at the fourth row down total, or I'm sorry, the fifth row, which is revenue to expenditure. So you can see we're deficit spending this year and the next years are positive. That means we're getting more revenue in the expenditures. But remember, this is before we reached any settlement agreements with any of our labor groups. And you can see beginning balances and ending balances. We have about four, that's about the total of the 4.253% plus the 1.25 of the board, what that means each year. And right now there's an assigned and unassigned balance in each of those years. Again, this is before any salary agreements have been reached. So right now it's looking pretty positive, which has helped those conversations. On the restricted side, we have a restricted budget. You can see expenditure or revenues about the same, um, up just a little bit because of some of the local revenue donations. Contributions went up just a little bit from the restrict, unrestricted side. 
Um, expenditures up really because of some COVID issues, which we'll go about. You can see we're deficit spending still. And remember that deficit spending number so large is because we received all the revenue last year and that we still have carryover technically and we're still spending against those dollars, but there's no revenue. The carryover doesn't count as revenue. It's in the book, so it's just new revenue. So that's why that we're using up money that we received the prior year. Beginning balance, and you can see the ending balance right now still looks positive for this year. Um, you can see revenue is up about 130K, expenditures up about 780. And you can see certificated and classified and up really because of the COVID related issues and some special ed costs. Benefits down a little bit. Um, books and supplies up really because of PPE and COVID issues and some stuff. And then contracts and services down. Um, some of those expenditures moved to transportation on the unrestricted side. And you can see our tuition and some of those went from the, the contracts to our tuition account somewhere else. So our tuition went up about 375 because of our special ed students that go out of district. Uh, Multi-year for restricted, you can see that um, revenue um, is, is a little more positive next year. But then in the following year, it looks like the revenue goes down. That's because there's, there's all the one-time money goes away. And you can see the expenditures also start dropping over time um, because really the, as the one-time money goes away, so do those expenditures. And you can see right now we're, we're in ending balance in, the, in that last year of about $73,000. We'll need to watch that, but that'll get trued up as we, as we move through the year and close up our one-time expenditures. One-time COVID funding, we've talked about this before. Um, we had a plan to support counselors and intervention teachers both this year and next year. That's including paraprofessionals. Um, the fund, and we're also using one-time funds to plan and offset unrestricted funding relative to our deficit spending and some of the agreements we've reached. And right now, our current obligations will expend those COVID dollars really through the end of next year. They should be expended with our current obligation plans. This is quickly a look at those funds that we received, about $20 million and all the different funding pots they came in with all the strings. And this sort of looks at those same pots of money and sort of how those dollars were, were expended in the previous two years or sort of what's been expended in 22, 23, including the stuff we still plan to do. And then the money that has been airmarked for 22, 23, really to support those counselors, um, intervention teachers in Paris that we'll be looking at for next year and addressing some of the deficit sending planning that we have included in our multi-year plan. So looking at this, the combined budget, really it's it's looking at the ending balance. And um, if you look in your packet, you have a your slide in your packets from first interim. So this is the true numbers from second interim. Um, I apologize that I clicked the wrong slide um, in pr printing. So right now we're, we're looking at an ending balance in the third year out of about $6.8 million. That's trued up to everything else you've seen in, in the document today. And that's really, that's where we are right now with second interim based on the January revise. Again, the settlement agreements have been, haven't been folded into this and that will affect that um, um, greatly. We have um, seven other funding sources, cafeteria funds, um, four, um, three building funds. We have our other post-employment benefits. Um, we have a, a non-capital project and capital projects. We have four building funds and three other funds that we monitor outside of fund one. Um, and, and we run those funds. So really fund 21 is really our major B funding. That's what's doing most of the work at uh, the, the, the Bristol Theater. And you, and you can see developer fees that are, are building some of those things that will help us with some of the new site at Lone Tree. To closure, to close tonight, just remember, we need to watch enrollment and attendance very carefully. That'll be the biggest thing that we need to watch locally. Second thing, we need to monitor our costs and our expenditures. It relates to what we do ongoing and one time. Um, the May revise is, is seems like around the corner, but it's really about two months off. Um, we know there's a lot of things that'll happen between then. That'll be the other thing that really affect the June budget. And I'm presenting the interim budget tonight for your approval. Be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Robin. Does anybody have any questions for Robin? I'll make a motion that we approve the second interim report. I second. A motion and a second to approve this inter second interim report. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes, 5-0. Uh, next up, item 10.3 is our COVID-19 update. And we do have a request for a public speaker. Uh, can I get a motion to open public comment, please? I'll make a motion to open public comment. A second. We have a motion and a second to open public comment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Motion passes five zero. Looks like we have one speaker who wants to speak on item 10.3. And that is Michelle Blasingame. Oh, hold on one sec, Michelle. Uh, Nicole, get the clock up. Thank you. Um, it says parents' fundamental rights in directing the care and custody and control of their children. Masks and vaccines are also emergency youth authorization approved only. Therefore, every single person on this planet has a right to opt out. I have here for the board members, I will clarify since you were not given correct instructions. This is a letter from your insurance provider. It clearly states that you are to comply with state or county laws and CDPH mandates. This does not mean you're going to lose your house because somebody's going to sue you because they got COVID at school. Number one, there is zero percent chance that anyone on this planet can prove that. Number two, the comply with state or county laws is not referring to the mandate. It's referring to actual law. The ones that you took an oath to follow, like don't block a child's airway, like do not remove a child from the classroom because they have every right to an in-person education. I will also note your insurance is the exact same insurance that Liberty High School District has. So you were wrongly informed. If you want clarification, I'll give you the actual documents. We've gone two years enforcing all of this bull crap. These masks do nothing, absolutely nothing. CDPH has no legal authority to enforce law or mandates. The mandates do hold force of law, however, they cannot overrule current law, nor can they cause harm or damage to any person. These masks are causing harm to our kids. It doesn't matter if the mandate says they have to wear a mask. If you're making the kids wear it, they're, you're harming children, which is violating a law. The recommendation also states, every effort is to be made to keep students in class. It also does not mention discipline. I can tell you there's been lots of unfair discipline across the district. At Bristow, there was an incident where milk cartons, juice cartons, apples, oranges were thrown at students with no masks. It was said that it was the other way around. Kids are being locked in rooms. The district, people in this room have informed all principals, secretaries, vice principals to mark children as an unexcused absence, even when they are on campus all day. That's illegal to do so. And it's a huge liability for you. Thank you. I don't have any other speaker cards, so I'll take a motion to close public comment. I'll make a motion we close public comment. A second. We have a motion and a second to close public comment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes, 5-0. COVID-19 update, Dr. Eaton. Yeah, thank you, board. So uh, here is our COVID update. Um, on February 28th, uh, the governor announced that starting for us, Monday, March 14th, masks would no longer be required um, in schools across California. So it goes into effect uh, at midnight on March 11th, which is a Friday for us. So um, he said that they're not required, but they're gonna be strongly recommended. Um, so we sent out a letter uh, letting our families know about that and our staff as well. Uh, as far as we understand at this point, the way that quarantining and notifications to families um, are working now, they'll continue to work in the same way. So we'll send those notifications out if there's somebody that's positive. Um, we will also continue to have masks available for any staff member, volunteer or student who would like one. 
Um, and uh, our understanding at this point is staff that have not provided proof of immunization are still required to test weekly as been going forward. So these are our uh, locations that we have. We still have testing. We see a dramatic reduction in the usage of our testing across the district. And so uh, those have, uh, but they're still available as we go forward. And this is just, I pulled these off today after 1130 when they were updating. So you can see the dramatic decline in the number of positives um, of COVID uh, across our county. These are from the county website. And then again, this is broken up. Uh, the top line is unvaccinated. The middle line is fully vaccinated without a booster. And the bottom line is uh, with a booster, showing the COVID rates all coming down dramatically. And this is by age group uh, who have tested positive. This is for the last 30 days. Um, and then this is, I've just kept track of the number. So I know it's a little small to see. Um, it'll be posted online, but, the, but where Brentwood is, so... Back in January, there were 1,827 positive cases within that 14-day period. It dropped to our, by our February 14 meeting, 352, and by today, it's to 116. So you can see that that's at one of the lower levels that we've seen uh, during this time. And then hospitalizations continue to trend downward as well. Uh, just a reminder that we continue to have the resources available on our website. We will be updating them. Um, they just, the uh, California Department of Public Health just released some new guidelines today. So we're working through those and we'll put those up there as well and try to get rid of uh, any information that's outdated. Um, we also are anticipating um, that we'll see our, our tracing dashboard continue to skew lower as it has. We have very few cases that we're seeing that are being reported. And then all that historical data is up there as well. So that's my update, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions? No, thank you very much. Moving on to item 10.4, update and feedback on LCAP progress and process. Yes, so uh, that's me again. Uh, in your packet, I, I just want to keep you uh, updated on uh, the progress uh, that we're making in our LCOP process. So I've included the, um, this isn't that, I'm going to show you on our website, but I've included in there our timeline uh, that you've seen before, the calendar. Um, and so we've gone through our strategic action planning process, and I just want to thank all these people uh, that participated uh, in, including Trustee Tweed Dow Jensen, who was uh, uh, an active participant for our couple meetings uh, as we went through. And see all these people from the community, staff, uh, parents, uh, community members. And then all of the projects that we went through are, are listed here and are all linked. So um, anybody on our website can see all of those. What you have in your packet, just as an update, is um, the feedback that we received from the committee from the different draft goals that you had originally seen, the adjustments that were made to the goals as a result of that feedback. And so now the part of the process is we go back out to our larger groups. So we go to our, our parent groups, our school sites, we go to students at middle school. Um, we get feedback on those goals again, again with the idea of having those goals and budgets to you in June revised for your approval that'll guide our work as we go forward next year. So it's sort of an accordion process that goes back and forth throughout the time. And so we just wanted to keep you updated as to where we are. But again, thank you again to all these people who participated. They, they gave up uh, multiple hours on a couple evenings and it was greatly appreciated. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Dr. E. If there are no questions, we'll move on to item 10.5. Approval of AB 1200 fiscal report. If you have any questions, essentially, we when we reach a tentative agreement, I need to do the math for that and send it off to the county for their review, and which is included in your packet. And we've received a letter back from their approval of that packet. So basically, that that document there shows. When you add the the salary, the TA settlement, and I do it for all groups, the math, um, we're about fifty thousand dollars to the positive in three years. So using the one time money and the the ending balance, we're positive in three years, and the county corroborate that. Yeah. So just a reminder, board is it's a requirement anytime you're entering into a negotiated agreement with a representative group that the county sign off that you can actually afford that agreement. So that's what AB twelve hundred is representing for you today. 
this is an action item. So if there are no other questions from the board, I take a motion to approve. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, AB 1200, the fiscal report. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Next up, item 10.6, approval of the tentative agreement with Brentwood Teachers Association. Good evening, board. In front of you this evening, I am pleased to present to you a tentative agreement that was reached with the Brentwood Teachers Association finalized last weekend. It has been ratified by the association, so it is before you this evening for your consideration and um, recommended approval so that then we would enact the tentative agreement. somebody like to make a motion? I'd like to actually thank everybody for their very hard work on this. I know it's been a long process for everybody and uh, I want to thank the teachers for uh, once again being understanding and hopefully at some point we'll have more. And I want to thank Robin and Roxanne for, for hanging in there and, and representing the district. So uh, that being said, I will make a motion that we approve the tentative agreement with the Brentwood Teachers Association. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Next up, 10.7, approval of additional staffing allocations for the 22-23 school year. So you have before you some additional staffing for the next, um, for the subsequent school year, 22-23, just a few additional positions, including some clarification around special education aids in SDC classes. From this point, any changes that would be made will be made through an internal process and wouldn't be um, brought to the board. So this would be the final step of the board's authorization for staffing for next school year. Great, thank you. Any questions? I'll make a motion that we approve the additional staffing allocations for the 22-23 school year. I second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Uh, moving on, item 10.8, approval of resolution 2022-02. So this resolution is before you um, based on the need to reduce some hours for our employee child care. Employee child care is offered at four of our sites for our employees before and after school is determined by them. And based on enrollment, they make changes. And so this is a situation where the school is having de decreased enrollment in their employee child care and therefore needs to reduce the hours for next school year. Okay. Any questions or discussion? I'll make a motion that we approve resolution 2022-02. A second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. That was our last item on the agenda. Next up, uh, any board member comment or future agenda items? Uh, Dana, I just want to reiterate if we can put that thing that we pulled March in regards to Mr. Geddes and his family for April. I will make sure that's on the next agenda. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. It'll reflect. All right. And then I have um, related to the present, the student presentation on the no drilling and passing our resolution. I'm just curious, you know, what would we need to do if I wanted to suggest that we as a board put a resolution together to support that? Yeah, sure. So um, any board member can present a resolution going forward. And so I can certainly assist you with that. We can look into see. I, the young lady, Alexi, mentioned that Liberty was doing one. I can follow up and see if they have one as well. And you and I can follow up on that. And then you can present it and request um, Mr. Gursky to put it on the agenda. And then the board can consider it at that point. Okay. Okay. I'd like to do that. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'll contact you. Thanks. Great. Anybody else? All right, our next regular board meeting will be held on April 13th at 6 p.m. And I believe we'll probably be back in the district office for that one. That's the plan. I know uh, staff is probably disappointed it only lasted an hour, so. Uh. <laughs> and thank you all for being here and have a great night. Take care. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.